Helene Olin, welcome to the Inquiring Mind podcast. Oh, thank you for having me on. Yeah, I'm happy we can uh, finally speak. Um, I read one of your books. I have this one, The Index. Okay. It's a very, very small yeah, book, so you can carry around. Yeah, um, and your other book is called Pound Foolish. So, Exposing the dark side of the personal finance industry. There we, there we go. And before we get started, can you tell the audience how you came to your career as a journalist and how you came to write these, these books? Um, well, I've been in journalism for several years when I uh, moved to Los Angeles with my husband and I was doing some freelance writing. And one day somebody called me up and said, can you sub in on Money Makeover at, 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 at the LA Times over the, was over the holidays? This is if you're a freelance writer, you know, over the holidays is a good thing. Um, you know, and you know, do you know anything about personal finance and made the fatal error of telling me what it paid before I could answer whether I knew anything about personal finance? Um, because all I knew about personal finance was that if somebody offered you double your normal rate, you should absolutely say yes to this immediately. So of course I said, oh yes, I know personal finance. And I thought I would do one of these pieces, uh, money makeover being like, you know, a fashion makeover, except it's your portfolio and your financial life instead of, uh, you know, beauty. And uh, I thought I'd get kicked out the door and that would be the end of it. And instead, I, I literally, to be clear, I know so little about this at the time. I'm literally, you know, like writing down financial terms phonetically because I don't know what the F they are. And I write this thing up and I hand it in and much to my shock, everybody liked it and asked me to do another and asked me to do another. And fairly soon, I kind of had a career doing it. And that was over 20 years ago. And how did you meet, obviously, you talk about it in the book, uh, Harold Pollack, who's your co-writer, co-author on this book, The Index Card. Harold Pollack um, asked me to do an interview for his blog cast, uh, which I don't think he has anymore when I, my last book, Pound Foolish, came out about the personal finance industry. And as some people might know, at some point during the interview, Harold said something along the lines of, you know, the whole idea of the personal finance industry is ridiculous because everything you need to know about personal finance can be summed up on an index card. And because this is the internet, uh, some people took Harold very literally and wrote him after the podcast and asked him where the index card was. <laughs> And Harold, of course, there was no index card, uh, but Harold, being an accommodating sort of person, goes to his daughter's backpack. His daughter was in high school at the time, uh, grabs out an index card with Sharpie and writes a few rules on an index card and takes a picture of it and posts it online. And the next thing we know, the whole thing's gone viral. <laughs> so we ended up, Harold, I ended up writing a book based off of the index card. Oh, um, and what struck me about the book, and, and I kind of learned about this in college, but if financial advice is as simple as being able to just write everything on one index card, why do we have financial advisors? Well, there's a bunch of different reasons, right? First, obviously, most rules are fairly simple, but the financial world itself is actually quite complex. And one of the reasons it's complex is because of all the various rules and regulations around it. But second, it's that people are very intimidated by it, right? So they think there's this idea that there's somebody out there who can help them navigate it and has this magic solve that has been sold to them, that there's this idea that there's this special person out there who can help you, you know, somehow beat the markets, who can somehow, you know, help you triumph over the world of, you know, income inequality and wealth inequality. And that this person can, you know, sort of guide you through all of this. And some of this makes sense, right? Like we're all very intimidated by money for the most part. M many of us could use advice. I mean, you know, hey, you get advice about all sorts of stuff, right? But the issue becomes, A, often these people don't have your best interests at heart. B, they're kind of selling you snake oil in many cases, because in fact, 
the moment somebody lets you in on the secret to beat the markets or to keep up with the markets, and it's not an index fund, um, you've got to ask what snake oil they're selling because, of course, that doesn't really exist. And as I like to point out to people, if it does exist, why the hell are they telling you, right? Because if I had figured out the secret to the markets, I mean, I would either be on my yacht off a tax-free island somewhere, happily trading away, or I'd be going to sell the secret off to like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett because that's where the money is, right? I mean, nothing personal, but your $100,000, say, just isn't that much money in the greater scheme of things when you've got the secret of how the markets work, right? So, you know, it's just this kind of whole idea that people are sort of sold on this idea that they def definitely need help. Mm. Yeah, I, I always found uh, personal personal financial advisors to be kind of, again, I just saw it as snake oil very often because mm -hmm. you could learn all of this, but I, I understand it's also, you know, if you ever learned it in school, that's a big factor. Uh, if you went to college and got a business degree, I think for the most part, you kind of know the ins and outs of, you know, uh, investing money in the stock market and how to do all of that kind of stuff. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, financial literacy, which is something of a mirage, and we can talk about that in a minute. But the, basically what they know is that general rule of thumb is, is the better you do at math, the more financially literate you are. Because actually it's pretty much a lot, to a huge extent, the, the same scale, right? There's a logic, there's, there's you know, facility you know, there, there's not there's not a lot you can actually quote teach somebody that's going to stick. I mean, Americans have this weird idea that like nobody knows how to save money and that they need to take a class in high school so that they learn how to save money, which is kind of ridiculous. People actually do know how to save money. Um, if they choose not to save money, it's not because they didn't take a class in high school about it. And the fact is, is when people were given tons of money or not tons of money, but relatively a large sum of money during the, 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 the lockdowns last year, we know what they did with it. They actually saved it in insanely high numbers. Um, as it turns out, people did want to save their money. They just often had to spend it on other things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So would you argue the fact that we don't need to teach financial literacy in schools or, or, or no? Or sh I would should we argue teach it? that it's fine to teach financial literacy. I actually, being from New York, New York is one of the few states that always had a mandate to teach financial literacy. So I took a class back in the early 1980s and really liked it. But the fact of the matter is, is, and the majority of states now have some teaching of it in the schools, but the idea that it's going to be a solve for our greater financial systemic problems is just not true because the idea that you know your grandmother or your great grandmother was more financially literate is something is just kind of not true the fact of the matter is is your grandmother or great grandmother lacked all sorts of things that we take for granted from ATM machines to easy credit to, um, you know, to second mortgages, uh, which, you know, are now called home equity lines. I mean, so the idea that you're going to teach people their way around this stuff is kind of absurd. But in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with financial literacy class. If I would make any argument at all, I'd say if you are teaching it in the schools, it should be combined with greater economic knowledge as a rule, right? So why isn't income inequality part of a financial literacy class? Because that's pretty basic financial literacy. Why isn't the problem of people getting ahead in our, in our country part of that class? And that's when you realize that financial literacy is actually very much designed in part as a way around all of this stuff to toss blame back on the victims of our economic system. Because financial literacy 
the way it is taught now presupposes that if you do everything right, you will be fine. That is unfortunately not true. I wish it were. Life would be a much, you know, the world would be a much better place. So, and you can really see this. I mean, you'll see after the financial crisis, which is when the really the boom sort of ticks up in the past, recent past, is you literally saw bank executives blame people whose houses were in foreclosure for the fact that their houses were in foreclosure and saying, well, if they'd taken financial literacy class, this wouldn't have happened, which is absurd. I mean, the banks and the financial services sector were making tons of money pushing these dodgy mortgages for, for you know, the better part of a decade. That's why this happened. And you know, the idea that somebody would take a financial literacy class and be able to dissect a hundred page, single space, small type mortgage you know, papers you know, and say, oh, wait, there's a gotcha term on page 46 of the third paragraph is absolutely absurd, right? If you really want people to be financially literate, the answer is, is you just simply don't allow mortgages like that. Yeah. And you mentioned before that um, we should incorporate teaching income inequality and um, into the financial literacy class. What, what, what would that look like? Well, I mean, it would be more about teaching economics, right? I mean, the idea is, is that the last time financial literacy had a huge moment, if you're wondering, is was during the first Gilded Age, when you would see this idea that if we taught immigrants how to manage their money, you know, they wouldn't be living in tenements. You know, people wouldn't be living in squalor. In fact, what why people were living in bad conditions was because the income gaps had opened wildly. Uh, they weren't earning enough money and they didn't have, there were at the time, there was very little government help if you ran into a tough patch. And, you know, so this idea that our ancestors lived this very virtuous life is just ridiculous, which you see surface all the time, right? In like David Brooks columns and whatnot. In fact, you know, if somebody's parent died, you know, children got abandoned. It was really kind of horrible, actually. And so financial literacy is sort of patched and it's pitched through the settlement houses and whatnot as this way to teach people to not do stuff like this. And in fact, what happens is, is the Great Depression comes along and the financial literacy movement dies out because even at that point, the people who are pushing it admit, and there's actually a great quote to this that I put in a piece I wrote a few years ago, that, well, when people have no money, you can't teach them financial literacy. This is obviously what doesn't work. And so the idea that, you know, that you're just going to teach people finances and they're going to be fine is just doesn't practically work. I mean, you really see this a lot with women, particularly a huge amount of the financial literacy apparatus, especially once you get out of the schools and you get to adults is actually pitched at women, right? Women don't learn about money, but women, you know, feel emotional about money. Women shop too much, blah, 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 right? In fact, all, none of this is really true. What we know is that women earn less, they have higher demands on their time and money, and they live longer. That's why they generally have less money. They earn less. They have to take care of family members. They, um, they don't shop more than men. In fact, if anything, what it is, is that how we think of shopping is very gendered so that shopping for clothes, which, by the way, women also do for children disproportionately, is seen as frivolous, but shopping for electronics is somehow seen as virtuous, So, which is done primarily by men. These myths insanely. Again, stuff that could be taught as part of the financial literacy class, but isn't. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. So one of the things uh, I, I actually have an economics degree from, from college. Uh, sorry, am I breaking up? A little bit, but it's okay. It's better. Yeah. Give me a second. Yeah. So uh, as a person that got an economics degree from college, uh, one, I never, I didn't take a class that I can recall where income inequality was taught. And the, the, the funny thing about income inequality is 
not many people know what they're talking about when it comes to income, income inequality. It's a very general term. So if, say, you know, a uh, person X earns more than a person Y, people are like, well, that's income inequality. And you, you put that into a macroeconomic perspective. That's a lot of X's are earning a lot more, uh, a lot more than most of the Y's. So there right. must be a disparity. So I feel like it's not really taught in college. And personally, I don't know why, um, how, and how you would teach uh, income inequality. Do you have uh, any insight into how you would teach income well, inequality? Well, people, you know, we write articles about it. So presumably people will eventually get it. I mean, the, I, I think you simply explain the facts of it. I think to me, what I find over and over again is that people confuse wealth inequality with income inequality which are two very separate concepts. Income inequality is earnings, wealth is net worth. And in fact, wealth inequality is arguably a more, plays more of a role in our current crisis that people, you know, the le- general rule of thumb is the less you earn, obviously it's harder to get money saved up. But secondarily, you know, wealth inequality is also based on these huge paydays for CEOs and the like. Um, It's also reflecting in huge stock market gains because yes, it's wonderful to put money in the stock market, but if you put in $10 and I put in 100 and we both invested in index index fund, I'm probably gonna come out ahead because $100 is gonna go further over time thanks to compound interest, right? So, you know, these things are just not really discussed very well in our society. I tend to think a lot of it comes down to flat out lack of logic and math illiteracy, um, I think are huge factors in it. But regardless, I don't think there is an issue in, you know, simply adding, you know, some basic facts about you know, income inequality and wealth inequality to a financial literacy curriculum. Because again, you know, the entire financial literacy curriculum is political, though we don't think of it that way. Uh, How so? It's political because you're teaching people the idea that this is something that will, you know, essentially most people believe that financial literacy is a way of tackling income inequality, wealth inequality, and um, you know, and various um, inequities in our society, which is just simply really not true. We don't have any reason to believe that people are behind, financially behind, because they're financially illiterate. The fact of the matter is, is they're financially behind often because they earn less money and they suffer historic discrimination. So if you don't teach people the reality of that, by definition, you're political. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe this is a case by case basis, but how how long can you account for historic discrimination when discussing income inequality? Right. Because, for example, um, there is a disparity between the amount African-Americans earn and white people earn correct um how long i guess in a, in a period of time can we keep accounting for the fact that it was uh you know a historic historic discrimination and plus let me uh put this out there all white people are not you know the same obviously right? obviously Some- not right but i mean I, I think you can fairly say that no group has been discriminated against in our country's history no group has suffered more from financial inequities, which isn't to say other groups don't suffer as well. But we know that people, I'm going to pause for a second. Can you hear me? Because I just got that internet unstable. Um, We know that, you know, Blacks, you know, were, you know, were, were promised 40 acres and a mule after slavery. No such thing ever happened. They were prohibited in many cases from going to college from getting a good education, from, you know, being able to purchase homes in certain neighborhoods. 
till fairly recently into basically my lifetime, right? And so the idea that this doesn't impact people to the present day is functionally absurd. In fact, we know during the mortgage crisis and the foreclosure crisis, Blacks were disproportionately targeted for the dodgiest of, of mortgages for higher interest rates, this continues to the present time, to, you know, more likely to lose their homes to foreclosure, and so on down the line, right? So the idea that this doesn't have present day ramifications, and I know it's uncomfortable for all of us to think about because the rest of us don't want to see ourselves as beneficiaries of this system, but in some ways we all are beneficiaries of this system. And that's where it gets very uncomfortable for a lot of people. We don't like to admit to that, I think. That, that the idea is that, you know, one reason we might have more is because somebody else has less. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the example I would use is that, you know, I am, very, I am a descendant of the immigration wave from 100 years ago. 120 years ago now, really. And one, you know, were my ancestors discriminated against almost certainly, but we were allowed to, you know, buy property. We were able to buy into the suburbs. We benefited from, you know, VA loans to, you know, buy houses in places like Levittown Town after World War II and so on down the line. Um, the great, you know, great housing developments were built in New York City for that cohort, Stuyvesant Town, uh, the Left Racks, et cetera. And, you know, for the most part, Blacks were not allowed to take part in that system. So when you think about that, it becomes a much clearer picture a lot quicker. And how before the most recent kind of, uh, I guess, group of immigrants. So if you came in the last 20 years, um, I think the part about this conversation, the, the one that you alluded to before. Right, but I'll fact- point out uh, one thing I'll say, and I'm sorry not to cut you off, no, no, it's okay. but immigrants traditionally come to this country with at least some money, right? Or some family backup in some way. The, or, you know, or, you know, the blacks were forcibly brought here. And that's a very different experience from the get-go. They didn't choose to come here. Um, now, you could say in some cases people were forced out, like, you know, my ancestors were essentially czarist draft dodgers. But the fact is, is that's a quantitatively different experience. And it's not something, as again, I don't think it's something a lot of us are very comfortable talking about and talking about the implications of. Right. Um... Well, I don't know. I I haven't looked into the statistics, so maybe you know better than I do. Uh, there are a lot of immigrants that come with well, almost no money. They come with enough money to, you know, come to this country and maybe pay some rent, but then they have to go to work almost immediately. And uh, my parents came from the former Soviet Union right. in in the in the mid nineties, and uh, they came with essentially nothing, right? So, and you know, they work their way up to whatever they, they, they work as now. And that's, that's their story. I'm, I'm not sure if most people come, I'm sure there are people that come with a lot of money and, you know, oh, they, I'm not saying people come with a lot of money, but I'm saying is they come with some social capital. Yeah. They but, come with education. They come with families, intact families in other places that they can reach out to. Um, is that not the, with, sorry, but uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but is that not the case for, well, African Americans uh, were forcibly brought here. No, I'm saying, but, but, but that's but, the case, right? I mean, so it's a very different scenario from the get go. And I mean, obviously, I'm not going to sit and parse every single immigrant group out here. But I think to be an American is to understand that blacks have had a very different experience of this country from the day they were forcibly brought here. They are the only group that is forcibly brought here. And that is a tremendous difference right from the beginning. And the idea that they're not discriminated against is absurd. They are discriminated against. And we could see this as recently as a year ago or two years ago when Newsday did that series on 
real estate in Long Island and they, you know, found the realtors on Long Island treating blacks extremely differently than they treated whites. I mean, that's not to say anybody has a particularly easy time of it in the United States. I mean, I will point out the United States, as I'm the first to forever point out, you know, does not offer, you know, the social safety net of most European countries at all. But at the same time, I think you have to be honest and say that Blacks are discriminated against. And if, you know, I, I find it hard to believe that somehow there are people who don't quite see that in this country. I mean, this is an obvious truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, yeah. Uh, so maybe to shift uh, topics a little bit, you are a opinion writer at the, the Washington Post and you write, is it one article a week? Is that correct? I write two. I usually two. do two. Two. And uh, on a variety of topics. Uh, so they're, they're very interesting and uh, fairly, fairly short. So anybody can read it. It's very accessible. Um, I would recommend it. It definitely challenged me on a few of my uh, beliefs. Um, so the first one is, have you as a journalist noticed a substantial difference? I know it's pretty what, five months in to the Biden administration uh, between the Trump administration and the Biden administration? Well, for starters, the Biden administration doesn't appear to be like trying to steal everything they possibly can within a four year period. So by definition, yeah, I've noticed a huge difference. Um, and I'm obviously speaking somewhat facetiously, but the Trump administration was basically there as a way to to sort of collect money for Donald Trump. And Donald Trump had all these ways of trying to make money off of this from you know, letting people use his hotels to appointing an extremely rich cabinet. Um, he appointed the wealthiest cabinet known to presidential administrations who then basically governed like this was you know, their way of collecting. I mean, the major accomplishment of the Trump administration is a ta tax quote reform that essentially allows the wealthy to, you know, rake in even more money while giving a few little crumbs to everybody else. The, you know, the gains to the wealthy and the Trump administration plans are in the, in the tax reform legislation that was signed by him are permanent, whereas the cuts that people, regular middle class people receive were sunset to, I believe, 2024 or 2025. I would need to go look that up. So, and they were infinitesimal. They basically would buy you like a dinner at Chipotle a week or something. So for two, I mean, but, you know, the regardless, they were infinitesimal compared to what, you know, the 1% was making off of them. And so I would say that was an enormous difference, right? The second enormous difference is Trump campaigns as I'm going to help the little guy and what does he promptly do? It promptly turns into how can we screw the little guy, which from everything, from literally taking down the names of people from the OSHA front page of who died in workplace accidents, burying them on the site, literally, to, you know, taking away all sorts of consumer protections at the CFPB and OCC, and so on. I mean, I mean the whole thing is basically a scam from beginning to end which of course shouldn't have surprised anybody who followed Trump's career because Donald Trump was a scamster from the day he showed up. Yeah. And uh, so one of the biggest, <laughs> this, this is one of those differences that I, I, I notice a lot where there are some very intelligent people uh, on both sides arguing two completely different points of view, right. On, on one person and one uh, I guess people maybe to the right, they don't have to be far right, say, well, a lot of Trump's policy did, uh, did some good. His foreign policy was sound, whatever their arguments might be. Mm -hmm. And then you have people um, on the other side giving a similar argument to the one you just gave. Um, why do you think that is? Why is there such a, a fervent belief in one side and then the other side as well? Because well, this is an interesting point because I, you know, I would say that politics became this sort of team sport, right? So you were either for this person or against this person without much in the way of nuance. 
And, you know, for what it's worth, I will give Trump his due on some levels, right? Some of the greatest gains in income were made in the past four years prior to the COVID um, pandemic, which, of course, he mishandled terribly because, of course, he can't manage anything. But, you know, so I, you know, and I will say, yes, the left as a rule does not give him his administration their due for that, right? But I think what happened was is everything became viewed through this very partisan lens where you're either for somebody or against somebody. So the idea that you might have a nuanced view of somebody or their administration is kind of off the table, right? You're either in favor of everything Biden is doing or against everything Biden is doing. You're either in favor of everything Trump is doing or against everything Trump is doing. And obviously this is not how it should work. I mean, obviously on some levels you should have some various points of agreement, but that's not how it's worked in the, in the, in the States in recent years. I would say that's partly the influence of social media, which sort of forces people onto teams. But I would also say, you know, the Trump administration really bears a share of the blame for this. I mean, you know, keep in mind, this is an administration that lost a re-election, um, whether one agrees with that decision or not. I mean, this is the voters voted and Trump lost in 2020, who essentially tried to do an end run around it and help what, you know, it was essentially a clown car of a coup um, that we don't really talk about it that way. And, you know, so the idea that two sides are equal is just ridiculous too, unfortunately. Um, I'm digressing a bit, but I mean, I, I think about this a lot. I mean, we have one party at the moment that's committed to democracy and one party that's not. That's a real problem. You know, even if the Republicans have some economic points, i.e., yes, gains were made under Trump, the fact of the matter is, is that's a party that is not committed to democracy as we understand it in the United States. And that's a real problem. Uh, one of the things that I, I see a real distinction uh, distinction in, in, in the current political landscape is the one between rhetoric. I guess this has always been the case, a rhetoric versus actual policy, right? Um and this is one that frustrates me personally, because uh, whatever people think of Joe Biden, he campaigned on being the, the great almost unifier. Right. And he wanted to bring the country into, quote unquote, into a normal period or bring back some normalcy. I have two concerns with that. One, it doesn't seem to me as of the, the first five months that there has been any kind of interest in uniting the country. It's just, you know, business as usual. So he advocates whatever his party wants. And that's, that's what, that's what happens. And then you have the, uh, the other side where uh, normalcy to me is a, is a, is a buzzword that could be seen as like, Oh yeah, everything is back to normal, but we can stop paying attention to this stuff. The one good thing I think Trump will, I'm not going to argue about all the good or bad things he Trump did, but one of the good things I noticed under the Trump administration is people actually paid attention. <laughs> and, that is absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, but but now you have this guy who's seemingly boring, right? And it's returned to normal, and people all of a sudden don't pay attention. Right. I mean, well, that's normal, right? Most people don't pay that much attention to politics. I mean, that's like, but politics. that's also but sorry, but that's a little bit. It could be a little frightening, too, because if you pay attention, that means you're always on. You're always alarmed, not alarmed. Sorry, that's not the right word. You're always sort of on edge and you can see that somebody is selling you snake oil sometimes. And you can be like, you know what? That's that's I don't agree with that. Or I don't that's know a good if that's policy. true. I mean, I think a lot of people paid attention and were just cheering on their team over the past four years, whether they were Democrats or Republicans. I mean, on one level, it's good they're not paying attention, right? Um, I mean, that's how it should be. I mean, politics should be something you don't have to think about. Um, what I would say is that I would 
say Biden's agenda is extraordinarily popular. You can look at any polling. Most people support what he is doing at very high numbers. Mm -hmm. That and that he's dealing with a party in, in or an opposition that is simply not committed to democratic norms. So the idea that he's going to negotiate with them at this point is absurd. Um, they're simply not, it's not really possible. I don't think that's a good thing, by the way. I don't want to sit here and say I'm defending that in any way, shape or form, because I don't, I grew up in a bipartisan era. I grew up when people voted for, for Republicans in New York City on a regular basis. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when Al D'Amato was my senator, you know, and so I don't, or George Pataki was governor for God's sakes, right? So I don't, I'm not going to giving you a speech that I think this is a good thing because I don't, but I think you have to be honest about the implications of the fact that we have one party that has essentially committed itself for over a decade now to obstructionism and blocking the other party as a way of getting ahead. So you've got the Democrats, and this is what happened under the Obama administration, kept reaching out to the Republican side and kept reaching out to the Republican side and got absolutely nowhere because Mitch McConnell decided that the way he was going to get ahead, and by the way, this worked, right, was that he was just going to stymie the Democratic agenda. So at a certain point, he was like, I'm not going to negotiate. I'm just going to block everything. I'm going to go, you know, if, hey, I, you know, if I can't, you know, I'm going to try to get the, the Supreme Court to overturn um, the Affordable Care Act, which the Repo- Democrats frantically tried to get the Republicans to negotiate with them on, and they just would not, right? So the idea that you can then turn around and claim, oh, he's not bipartisan, or he's not governing in a bipartisan fashion, is not really fair. Because we know that whenever an attempt is made, it goes nowhere. And until that changes, that's not anything that's on the Democrats. That's something that's on the Republicans. The Republicans need to come together with the Democrats. And for instance, right now, Biden is trying to put out there that he is going to negotiate on infrastructure. Well, let's see what the Republicans come up with. I mean, and again, this is where it starts getting complicated. What's infrastructure? Why, you know, why, why do we consider some things infrastructure and not others? Is the expansion of the idea that we have human infrastructure a good thing? Um, and so on down the line. And these are all things that can be debated. But when you have one side whose total goal is to simply stop the other side from succeeding at any cost, you are definitely in a position where nothing is going to happen in a bipartisan fashion. Yeah, uh, to maybe use John Boehner's, uh, he, he had a book. He had a book recently, and I thought it was quite good. A little bit funny. I haven't read it. I've read excerpts, but I've not read the books. So I can't That's claim. Just uh, entertaining. That's all it is. Um, and he called them crazies on his side. So he has a bunch of he he had to deal with a lot of people that were you know maybe I'm not even going to say far to the right. They're just they're almost moral absolutists, right? They they wanted everything 100 percent their way, and if they didn't get it. They're going to run to their, you know, Fox News or Breitbart or wherever they run to and complain that they didn't get their way. And he had to deal with that. Now, the flip side is, um, and again, Boehner acknowledges, gives Pelosi credit because she's managed to somehow try to keep her crazies in check. But the Democratic Party is undergoing almost a similar uh, similar trend than, in my opinion, obviously, I'm not going to speak for anybody else, but uh, than the Republican Party is. So the the Republicans have their crazies, and the Democrats have their crazies. And well, both sides traditionally have their their you know partisan foot soldiers, is how I would put them. Yeah, but you I know, guess, are, but but you're sorry, but you're trying to you, you're you're arguing that there are more on the right than they're on the left, correct? Well, the 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 left is not running is not supporting coups against the government by definition the left is more reasonable like you can't argue your way around that i mean we have the right wing of the of the republican party essentially you know trying to excuse what was a coup 
by definite, you know, I mean, that it didn't succeed and that it was something of a clown car of a coup doesn't change the fact that it was a coup. You know, it just wasn't a successful coup. But so to to uh, to make the two parties equivalent is simply not correct. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to go along with that. I, I would agree that the left wing of the Democratic Party can sometimes be out there. There are things I also happen to agree with them on. And again, I will point out that things like, you know, universal health and health care and government supported health care and expanding Medicare to cover the popula- the entire population are actually extremely popular. And that it's kind of a fallacy that they're sort of chalked off to the left, when in fact, what's really going on is it's only the far left politicians like Bernie Sanders who are willing to publicly champion them. But when you look at polling, this stuff's actually quite popular. Most Americans do want universal pre-K. Most Americans do want, you know, some form of guaranteed health coverage. Um, So these are actually fairly popular positions in the United States. It's kind of not correct to simply equivocate the two. It is not a popular position to say, you know, say we should do away with the Affordable Care Act, right? It, these are, it's simply not. I mean, most people support it. And they support it fairly large numbers at this point. So th- this is, there's just not an equivalence here. And I refuse to play along with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and by the way, I, I'm, I, I consider myself down the middle. I don't, personally, I'm not a big fan of either party. But mm-hmm. um, as a person that kind of, watches this game go on between two sides that I'm not a big, a huge fan of. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm watching this and um, you're, you're right. You're right. Maybe, maybe the left in terms of in the political sphere is not as crazy as the Republicans are. And, but for example, uh, one, one subject that's very close to me is education. Right. And, pretty much every mainstream university in this country is left-leaning. Like you have a lot of professors that are openly left-leaning that teach a certain political view over another um, without much, without pretty much any. That's not the fault of the democratic party. Right. I mean, I think we're talking about two different things here. I mean, democratic party is not going into universities and saying, teach this or teach that. I mean, this isn't the old Soviet Union. I mean, this is the United States. No, I understand, I mean, but it, right. but it's still these similar ideas that are espoused in the Democratic Party that are espoused on college campuses. Yeah, uh, yes, and no is the answer. I, I mean, I think campuses have traditionally it's tend to have a lot of young people, and young people tend to lean towards extremes. I mean, that's not like an unknown phenomenon. If you get older, you tend to, uh, you know, understand the world is a more nuanced place. Again, uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> you'll get there. Don't worry. You'll hate everyone before it's all over. Um, but the so I don't think it's totally fair to, uh, you know, a th- to throw the two in together. You know, you know, do uh, does the left, you know, go off on, you know, Praise tangents? Of course they do. I mean, you know, cancel culture is a thing, for instance. I don't care who tells says it isn't. It's really annoying. It's not right. And it's kind of creepy, frankly. I mean, I, I'm not saying anything to you. I haven't said on Twitter a hundred times over. Um, and the idea that anyone on the left supports that sort of stuff infuriates me. I completely agree. I find, but I find it a kind of weird twist on believing in our system, right? Because what is the ultimate punishment in a capitalist system? Removing somebody from their means of earning a living and accumulating wealth. So, you know, that the left is then turning around and do, doing that, though for the record, the right has done that for a long time too, is, you know, yeah, it's kind of creepy to me. I won't say it's not, but... I think the idea that there's some massive conspiracy going on and that, you know, this is what's going on on college campuses because the Democratic Party ordered it is absurd. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not. 
Yeah. I'm not of that opinion. I'm just okay. saying that the trends seem to be similar. The way people, um, the topics people talk about very commonly and almost like without thinking twice. And they use certain terms that come straight out of college campuses. Right. And these are well, elected. Yeah. I mean, well, to, to be fair, the Democratic Party does tend to attract you know, the higher, more educated people, you know, college graduates tend to vote Democrat more, right? You, there is this language that has kind of slid over to the, to the, to the left that I would argue obfuscates as much as it elucidates, but, you know, yeah, it's kind I certainly find, you know, academic jargon certainly incredibly annoying when it gets used, Um, you know, but, that's not on the Democratic Party, um, certainly. Um, you know, I would say, however, in a two-party system, Democrats and Republicans are really operating in two different worlds at this point because the Republicans are trying to appeal to a narrow base while the Democratic Party is actually trying to handle an extremely broad tent that really ranges from people on the far left to people who are actually quite conservative, but don't hold with things like having coups in, in, in the United States Capitol. So by definition, the Democrats are trying to balance a lot more balls, so to speak, than the Republican side is at this point. And you're going to see some amount of craziness as a result of this and, you know, an intellectual incoherence as a result of that. It's a lot easier if, you know, you're just trying to appeal to a fairly small conservative group. Is that what the Republican Party is doing? Yeah. I mean, they're basically trying to appeal. I mean, if their incoherence is that, and Trump actually encapsulated their incoherence incredibly well, their incoherence was that they were trying to merge this socially conservative worldview with a, you know, business laissez faire um, agenda. And which is believed by very few people, really. And so they're trying to merge these two, and that's their incoherence. And as a result, they can be fairly incoherent too. But at the moment, you know, they're simply just trying to enforce a feel, um, an allegiance to Trump, and which is just easier. If you're going to throw everybody out of the party who disagrees with Donald Trump, yeah, you got an easier job on a certain level. Whether that'll get you elected any to anything or not is a different question, of course. Yeah. But it is an easier job. Yeah. Um, this is this is a difficult question because um, I just think it's a difficult question. But anyway, I mean, I have to wrap in about five minutes. By the way, I yeah. Have to. Go, sure, sure. Um, but what do you do with the seventy million uh, people or over seventy million people that voted for Donald Trump? What do you uh, the same thing you always do with the 70 million people who voted for the, the person who lost any other election. They get to try again in 2022 and you get to try again in 2024. I mean, this is not a new problem in the United States, right? We have elections every couple of years and a lot of people vote for the person who didn't win. That's just a fact. And they somehow, until this year, figured out a way to deal with it and persevere and try again. It's not a unique phenomena to vote for somebody who lost an election. I have voted for many people who have lost elections. I would assume you did as well. I did not vote for Joe Biden in the primary, for instance. To give a perfect example, I voted for Elizabeth Warren. I mean, it's... So the idea that this is how, or in 2016, for that matter, I voted for Bernie Sanders, not Hillary Clinton. I mean, so the idea that we have to somehow especially coddle this group of people strikes me as fundamentally absurd. We don't. I mean, do we want to take their concerns into account? Of course we do. It's a democracy, okay? This is how democracies work, as you everybody kind of figures out how to work together. But again, when you have a former president, and that would be Donald Trump, to be very specific, who's claiming he didn't lose the election and it was stolen from him and he doesn't legitimately recognize the result of that election. And he's got a lot of people who are agreeing with him. You've got a much bigger problem than we've ever had before. 
yeah so to begin again i know you have to go so uh to wrap up maybe on an optimistic note let's uh, i really do want to end this on an optimistic note uh what gives you hope for the future and the second question is what are five books that you would recommend fiction or non-fiction to to anyone Sorry, your sound is muffled. Sorry. Oh, okay. That the United what gives me hope for the future is that the United States somehow always manages to do right in the end. Um, and if you're in any fundamental doubt about that fact, uh, look at how the vaccines worked with COVID, which is just kind of this extraordinary achievement at the moment, and not anything any of us really thought we would be seeing a year ago right now. So I would say that has given me a lot of hope for the future. Um, what, or to quote the old line from Churchill, you know, the United States always does what's right after it's tried all the other alternatives, right? But we do get there. Mm -hmm. The, um, so what five books, I always read, my favorite childhood book is A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Um, anything by Barbara Ehrenreich. I'm especially fond of Nickel and Dimed, which really tells you how people live in this country. Um, I also really love Bright Sided, which is a really acidic uh, deconstruction of how it, it sort of Americans fall for self-help and, you know, you can do it, you know, you go girl type language. Um, and I think it's an extraordinary achievement. Um, I would say um, if you ever want to understand how loneliness works, um, you know, Robert Putnam's um, Going book about along. that is fantastic. But fiction wise, um, Charlotte Bronte's Villette is probably the loneliest book ever written. Um, and I do reread it occasionally. Um, not that we got to talk about this, but I'm actually fascinated by the role of loneliness in American life, um, which I think is a very profound thing. Um, Jonathan Robbins' Badland um, is something I go back to again and again because it's a real deconstruction of our myth of the frontier. Um, for those of you who don't know, because it's a fairly obscure book at this point, Jonathan Robin, um, who was a New Yorker journalist who died a few years ago, um, became fascinated with the history of the settlement of the Montana Prairie and what happened to those people. And it's, one, it's a really great book um, because it did not end well for very many of them. We have this idea that people settled the frontier here and it was all well and good. And, that's not really how it worked. Um, I would say fifth, a um, couple of books that written in the years running up to the crash about that deconstructed Americans and their finances. I would say Kate Jennings, Moral Hazard and Fred Lebron's, um, what was it called? I'm blanking on the name for a moment, uh, Six Figures. Um, both real deconstructions of how money works in families in American life fiction that were just both fantastic and are both all but forgotten at this point. Awesome. Um, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and speaking with me. I always, I like the disagreement and uh, always has to end respectfully. That's, that's what I like the most. So thank you for speaking with me today. Oh, you're welcome. Have a good one. You too.